So we're in a, we're in a series at the moment um, called Sorry Not Sorry. And uh, for those who may be over 40, if you're, if you're uh, not a millennial, Sorry Not Sorry means it's basically a way of being unapologetic about not apologizing. Like I say something or I do something that I know is going to offend you, but I'm not sorry for it. So that's where the saying comes from um, in the vernacular. But it's to, you know, it's just to, in, in the 80s and the 90s, we were different. We said stuff and we did stuff that we knew was going to offend you. And we just, we didn't feel like we needed to say we weren't sorry. We just weren't sorry. It was just, it was a different time back then. But now you have to kind of, like, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. So if you're with us, this is what the series is about. And it's, it's a series on some of the hard sayings of Jesus. Some of the tough things that Jesus says to us. Because there's moments where Jesus says things. And it's recorded in some of the Bibles in red. But it's, it's quotes of Jesus where he said some stuff that you're like, yo, that is harsh. Like you're not being very Jesus-y. Like you could be a bit more Christ-like if you tried. And unfortunately, I think, I think many of us have a picture of Jesus as this kind of Scandinavian, half a head taller than everyone else with like straight light brown hair and blue eyes and a purple sash and a small lamb in his arms. And he wasn't. He was a builder. He was a carpet. He worked hard. He was a, he was a, the Bible says that he was, he was unable to recognize him from the other people in society. It wasn't like he was this radiant and ruddy, you know, glowing with a halo walking around. If, in some instances, they would lose him in the crowd because he would, looked so much like everybody else. And Jesus sometimes does things, and I think he, he, he pointedly says things in a harsh way to pierce our hearts with biblical truth. And so last week we spoke about, the, the title was, If You Can, and it's where the disciples couldn't um, heal the, the man's boy who had a, a mute and a deaf spirit and would like throw him into fire and water, and, and the father comes and says, If You Can, Heal Him, and Jesus kind of says, If You Can, Everything Is Possible for him who believes. And so that was last week. That's a bit of, just a bit of a recap. And this week we're in John chapter 6. And I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture, which is never a bad thing on a Sunday morning. Um, but it's, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn over, to, turn over to John chapter 6 or click on over if you've got the app. Um, but what we've got here is, it's, again, just a, an, an amazing moment. We've got John chapter 6 starts off with Jesus feeding the 5,000. Then we see Jesus walking on the water. And we're going to read from, from verse 25. And um, this is one of the, oh no, 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 it's not. So anyway, John chapter 6, verse 25. I'm going to read it out of the NRV. So if you've got a different translation, it might sound a little bit weird. Hey, if you would like a Bible, if you, if you know someone who needs one, we've got some English Afrikaans and Zulu Bibles on the back table there. There's only three out because we generally don't get more than that taken. But if you want to take more, please take more. So if you know someone who needs one, if you would like one, please help yourself. They're free. We want to make that available to everybody. So grab that. All right, you all got John 6? So, John chapter 6, verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Referring, obviously, to the feeding that he's just done of the 5,000. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him... God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Can you say works? works? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? Someone say sign. sign. What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Jump down to verse 43, a little bit lower down on the page. Jesus says, Stop grumbling about among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Verse 53, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And then verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Verse 66, a bit further down. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Wow. Wow. What a passage of scripture. Seems a bit weird, if we're honest, to start off with. But if we go back, Jesus has just, like at the beginning of chapter 6, so a page back, he's just fed the 5,000. So 5,000 men, as John records it, so there would have been women and children there as well. And that would have added to the number, so you can guesstimate at how many people were there. And, and that, fi- that feeding of the 5,000, interestingly, side note, is one of the few uh, miracles that Jesus does that's recorded in all the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those line up quite often on a lot of things, but John doesn't always carry everything he's got there because they're writing to different audiences and there are witnesses and record different things. But but what's happened here is is Jesus is is hammering home a truth that he's saying, you guys missed this in the feeding. I fed you the, the bread, and it's not just because people were hungry and it was late in the day and they needed some food, but Jesus was doing it in a, to show that he is the bread of life. And he's going, you've missed this. So let me help you understand what is going on. And so he launches into this discourse on this teaching on the bread of life. And he constantly refers back. Uh, we read it three or four times there where he refers back to the Israelites. And that's what he's getting at. He's saying God provided for them and they died because that was just a simple daily bread that he provided. But he's now given you the bread of life and you are missing it. I gave you bread as a physical explanation of that, as a kind of a, another harking back to Moses and the Israelites in the desert. I've given you all bread out of these five loaves and two fish. That's what he had. And, then, and there was so much left over that they had 12 basketfuls that they picked up after feeding the 5,000. It's an incredible picture of God going, I'm going to provide for what you need, but even more. Unlike the desert where they had to, this is now living bread that we get. And it's, it's so crazy for me to see. And if we look at what happens here, the crowds and the disciples, they have, I'm just going to pick out two things that, they, that we see in their response and, and the mistakes that they make in responding to this teaching that Jesus has here. And, and the first response that they have where Jesus is talking to them is they ask that question, verse 28, what must we do? Now, to be sure, our walk with Jesus involves a lot of action. It involves a lot of doing. We do have to do stuff. Ephesians 2 says, God has prepared good works for us in advance to do. But what they are getting at here, what they are missing is that they are slipping back into a works mentality. They are slipping back into a checkbox mentality where they're going, what do we need to do to please God? What do we need to do to make sure that we have checked all the boxes and we are acceptable to God? They're going back to a legalistic way of thinking of going, how can we earn this righteousness with God? And that is, man, that is so often what I find myself getting back into, is I like to keep things nice and neat. And I like to, we, have a, we get this checkbox mentality, like a, a reminder list or a to-do list for the day. And we're like, yes, quiet time, read three chapters, prayed, you know, da, da, da. tick things off the list as we go through. Feed the dog, feed the kids. We just, we add it into our to-do list of time with God. We add it into just our checkbox mentality. But, and, and I think for me, a large part of the problem, and, and I think probably for most of us, is that we're so busy 
in our lives. We live such hurried lives that we have to put things in check boxes to make sure that we're getting things done. And we kind of like, we look at it and we go, okay, Lord, what do we need to do? Like, okay, so I've got to share the gospel. Like, we, we heard it, we've got to share. So, okay, I'll slot that in. Tuesday, 9.45, Lord, I'll give you like a 45-minute slot. That's a long one. Normally only half an hour, but for that one, I'll give you a 45-minute slot. And we, we almost want to prioritize it on our calendar, put it in red on the calendar. And, you know, we kind of want to plan our lives because we're so hurried and we're so overwhelmed with everything that's going on. And we're not fixed on Jesus. We're not, we don't have our lives subordinated to what he is saying. And we kind of see it almost like an upcoming root canal. And we like dread it. And we look, okay, so Tuesday, oh my goodness, we've got to share the gospel again. Tuesday, 945, it's coming, Lord. But I love Jesus' response. He's, he's so gracious as he brings them back to relationship. He said, it's not about what you need to do. The very next verse, 29, Jesus' answer, he says to them, this is the work of God. Well, the work of God is this, to believe. You know, how do you do believing? It's like you, it's a, it's a tough thing to like go and go and do believing. It's like, it's an awkward thing. It's like I can dig a hole, I can cut down a tree, I can paint a house. Okay, you go and do believing. And it's hard because I know for me, like it's such a, I'm a very like goal oriented person, but it's relationship that Jesus is bringing them back to. He's saying what's important is not what you do for God, it's that you are with God. It doesn't matter what you do. It does, but it doesn't. You've got to be with God. What matters is the being with God. That's what God requires, to believe in Him and in Jesus. He says to believe in the one He has sent. And that's what we do. All the other stuff is ancillary. It's for our benefit. All the spiritual disciplines and the praying and the reading of our Bible and those things are for our good. God gives us those things so that we can benefit. It's not so that we can check boxes and and be better Christians and then God's more pleased with us and he gives us more money or more health or whatever it might be that you're looking for. Those things are for our benefit. All we need to do is to believe. The second response, and this is a, this is a, this is a beautiful mistake that we so often make. Their, their second mistake, and this is our mistake as well, seeing is believing. Have you, you know, we know that one. Eh? People, have, people have said that one. Well, show me and I'll believe. Show me and I'll believe. Seeing is believing. That's the, that's the mistake. We want to, we want, and, and I used to have this argument. You know, I was, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't, I wasn't saved very young. So I was lack of vinchat. And I, I, I'm just less vinchat now, but God's working on me. He's patient. But I, I, I really, I still am like this with a lot of things. I'm like, show me and I'll, I'll like I, I struggle with things. And it's my, maybe it's my rebellious nature, but God's gracious with me in that as well. And we, we want to we see before we believe. But you know what's amazing in this? Because they're going, oh, show us. Show us this thing. Show us this. Tell us what to do and, and we'll see. Like if, you, if you only just show us Jesus, we'll... But what's incredible is if you read in... A little bit earlier, we didn't read it, but in chapter 6, verse 14. John chapter 6, verse 14. It reads like this. It says, the people saw the miracle. These same people who've just seen Jesus feed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, they're now going, Jesus is giving them this explanation on the bread of life, and they're going, show us. Show us a miracle. You can imagine Jesus' frustration. He's like, are you really that short? Are you like a memory of a goldfish here? We go around and you're like, three seconds later, you've forgotten what's going on. You've gone around the bowl and you've come back and you'd be like, oh, this is a new, this is a new corner of the bowl. <laughs> but we're like that, aren't we? We forget so quickly. We forget so quickly how good God has been to us. We forget so quickly how gracious He's been to us over a long period of time. We're so quick to complain. We're so quick to go, oh Lord, this thing. Like, it, this. And God's going, have you not seen how I've carried you? Have you not seen? Remember last week, Tuesday, when you went through that difficult thing and I brought you through and you're fine? Or last month or last year? It's good to remember, guys. It's good to go back and see. Because with that thing that you're struggling with and that you're going, oh, Lord, show me how you're... I can almost guarantee you, if, you've been, if you walk with Jesus more than a couple of days, you've got some history in your life with Him where He has saved you. Yeah. Where He's been gracious to you. We're so quick to, to forget. We whine easily. Like a child who's missed a meal and thinking they're never going to get fed again. But what Jesus does in this thing, and, he, and, he, and here is where he gets pointed in what he says, and the title for our sermon this week is Bite Me. 
And if you know that saying, and my wife struggled with it, she was like, are you sure? You really want to pick that one? Like, are you, are we not going to, that might be. I was like, that's the point of what Jesus is doing, is he's being offensive. Is he saying to people, because you see to us in our Gentile sort of Western modern mindset, and, and we've had, you know, the Twilight Saga has softened us to the drinking of blood, but for the Jews, it would have been a very difficult thing for them to hear this. So eating meat with any blood in was absolutely forbidden, was against the law. They had to drain the blood completely out of the meat as much as they could, dry it out, and then they had to cook the blood out of the meat to make sure there was no blood in that meat. I mean, no medium rare steaks here, buddy. Is it well done? That's how you eat it, well done. But it was, and, and so the meat looks gray before they cook it. Like if you get Jewish kosher meat, it's gray before they cook it. It doesn't look very appetizing at all. But that's how, that's how intent they were on not drinking the blood or taking in the blood of, of an animal. Because in the law, it was seen, the, the blood was seen as the life of that animal. When the blood came out, it wasn't the death of the animal. It was, it was seen as the life of that animal, and they didn't want that life. So, so for them, you know, eating the blood of an animal was forbidden. And drinking the blood of a human being, that was, I mean, that was so taboo that it wasn't even spoken about. It just wasn't mentioned. There were no vampire stories in those days. And so it was just, what Jesus is getting at here, it would have been like a sledgehammer to the forehead amongst the eyes. That's what it would have been like. That's how harsh what he's saying is for them. And we, we sometimes miss it. But see, and, I, and again, even in, even in this passage, they miss the symbolic meaning of what Jesus is saying. And so often we get like that. We, we, we read some language in the Bible. And we want to take it so literally. But we miss that it's actually metaphoric language, that Jesus is speaking in symbolism. And, and, and like sometimes we struggle with it in the Bible, but we use it so often in everyday language. But we, we struggle to read it in the Bible. So what Jesus is, is getting at here is, is not some form of cannibalism or anything like that. He's using, he's using a phrase that, or he's using a, a metaphor, an idiom that means something else. That has a deeper spiritual meaning. And we need to pursue Jesus and seek his meaning. And, and if you think you, we don't know it, I mean, in, in our languages, we use it all the time. But because we use it, we don't see it. So... I'm busy doing Zulu lessons with Father Doherty, the Catholic priest in, in Matuba Tuba, and it's super interesting. It's, he's an absolute legend of a man. But this one, and so he, he's, he's helping me out with like learning how to use Zulu, not just like learning it, but how to use it. And, and there's a saying when parents have a daughter that's born to them, and there's a saying that says, Izinkoma zitando kubuya. And it, it literally means the cows tend to come back. I mean, like, did you just call my child a cow? But what it is, is it's saying, the labola you've paid, you're going to get labola back. And it's a, it's a saying of celebration. The cows tend to come back. And there's one for a son as well. But, I mean, it, you know, and so we have it in English as well. If you see someone driving past you, um, the, the elder was flying down the road this morning um, and <laughs> while he was driving. And, and uh, we, we understand that he wasn't literally flying. The wheels were on the road. But we, he was just going real fast. It's symbolic language. We understand that, yeah? And so that's what Jesus is doing here. So don't get lost in the metaphor and don't, don't miss what Jesus is trying to say here. But, but, and, and for us, you know, Jesus against those two errors that we spoke about, the one of the checkbox mentality and the one of the short memory, short-term memory, problem is he gives us this beautiful moment of communion communion is meant to counteract those two errors that we make because when we take communion there's there's very little like physical benefit from communion it's not like a full meal it's not balanced it doesn't have all the right food groups there's no chocolate in it and and so we, we we're not taking it like for our sustenance our physical sustenance and it it's not actually we don't believe it's actually the body and the bread of, uh, the, that the bread is the body, the physical body of Jesus Christ, and that the wine or the juice is the physical blood of Jesus Christ. That's not what we believe. They are symbols of Jesus, his body broken for us and his blood shed for us. And so what communion does, it's a metaphoric action when we take it. It's a symbolic action when we take it that we are taking in the body of Jesus. Now, when you eat food, your body breaks it down. That becomes part of your body. 
That food literally becomes part of you. The molecules become your molecules. Not all of it. Some of it passes away. But it stays there. And most of it becomes part of your body. And it's the same with Jesus. That's what he's getting at here. Is he saying, my body needs to become so... I need to become such a part of you that it becomes part of your cells. That I become part of the molecules of who you are. It's not magic bread and juice or wine. It's not enough to give you energy. But it is enough to give you life. See, taking communion forces us to take a moment and slow down from our hecticness and our busyness and stop. And consider what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And think about, man, why would God die for me? Why would God pour out his life in his blood for me? And if you ask that question honestly, you'll very quickly find there's very little reason for God to do that in you. And it quickly turns you to him. And it goes, it's only because of his gracious, unconditional love that he's done that. We get to share in the life of God. We get to share in the eternal life of God through Jesus. And that's what he said when he said, I am the bread of life that comes from heaven. You are what you eat. Famous saying. You know that one? You are what you eat. How does it go? There's a, there's a second part to it. You are what you eat. And then, I don't know, something about the worms eating you. Something about... And then what you eat become, eats you or something like that. I don't know. I can't remember. I had it, but I didn't write it down. Sorry. Anyway, you are what you eat. And so are you feasting on Jesus? Are you feasting on Jesus daily in your, in your everyday life? It's easy on a Sunday to come and kind of like feel like we need to be fed and spiritual and sit there and receive. But daily in your life, are you feasting on Jesus? Are you becoming one in union with him? This is what it means to become like him. We're not, we, this is what a discipleship to Jesus means. We're not just trying to copy him or imitate him or pretend to be like that. We're actually taking him as such a part of our being that we literally become more and more like him. We are transformed into his likeness by faith. Augustine of Hippo is a, was one of the early church fathers, uh, probably one of the one of the main geniuses in the history of humanity, he puts it like this. He said, Credi et manducasti. And I said, yes, I agree. <laughs> believe and you have eaten. He said, believe and you have eaten. Speaking of this verse, or the, the verses that we've read here, this bread of life discourse that Jesus gives, he says, believe and you have eaten. This is how we take the bread of life. This is how we take in Jesus, is to believe in what He is. Where He says the work of God is to do this, believe in the one who He sent. When we believe, we are eating the body of Jesus and drinking His blood. Jesus is not pushing for some form of weird cannibalism or... He, it's not what He's about. Don't get hung up on the immediate picture, which is what the disciples and the Jews did. And it's interesting because they have... Like they have a particularly idiomatic language. Like there's a lot of word pictures in their, in, their, in their language that have other meanings. And so they miss this thing of what's going on, of what Jesus is saying. Don't miss what God is saying to us this morning. They had the Israelites, the picture of the manna in, in, in the wilderness. You know the word manna? It literally means what is it? That they named it, what is it? What did you eat in the desert? No, we ate what is it? And you're kind of like, oh, that's a weird name for something. But that's the bread that they had. And Jesus, three, four times in that, in that thing, he says, they ate that and died. But you eat this and you live. And you see, what he's getting at is that it's not about the physical thing. That's what he's making the point there. He's saying you need to believe. That's where eternal life comes. When we believe now, that life of Jesus, that eternal life, we get to live now. See, we often, we often think eternal life starts when I die physically. Then I'm going to live eternal life. But Jesus is saying, no, no, if you believe now, you get the life of God from heaven. So you start living an eternal life now. And that has massive implications for us because therefore who I am now is going to be carried through in my eternal life forever. That's the only thing we take with us. The body dies and is buried or burnt or whatever, eaten by worms, whatever it is. But who we are in ourselves, that carries on and that's what God is working on now that's what God in his discipleship and his love for us is changing and forming into 
the nature of Jesus. So Jesus, as the bread of life, declares to those who, who are there, he says, you will never be hungry again. If you go back two chapters to John chapter 4, it's a lot of the language and the pictures that Jesus is using is very similar to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman that he meets at the well, where he says, he, he asks her for water and she's kind of like, hey, you shouldn't be drinking out of the same cup as me. We don't really. Um, and Jesus says, I'll give you living water. And she looks at the well and she goes, it's deep, bro. you don't even have a thing to get the water. And Jesus says, if you know who is talking to you, you would ask me for water and I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. And she says, well, can I have some of that, please? And Jesus is like, you're missing it. And then he speaks freedom into her life and he brings, he brings her out of her sin. He basically says, you've had five, six husbands, but the five husbands, the one you're with now, not your husband. And he doesn't condemn her. And he brings grace and forgiveness into her life. And that's the living water. That woman who was just a slave, she then gets the living water from Jesus. What does she do? She goes back to her community and pours out that living water yeah. and says, you've never, there's someone who's just told me everything. You've got to come and meet him. He's the Messiah. It's living water flowing out. She didn't even realize it, but it was happening already. And so the picture is very similar to what's happening here. And what Jesus says, he says, if you eat this bread, you'll never be hungry. It's incredible. And at the end of that interaction with the woman at the well, the disciples had left and then they, they had gone to go buy food for them and they came back. Jesus is interacting with the woman. They're like, this is a bit weird. Sure, rabbis don't talk to women in public. But they're too scared to say anything. The woman goes and they say, well, we've got the food. And Jesus says, I've got food that you know nothing about. I've got food to eat that you know nothing about. And they're like, did he, did he eat while we were gone? Did he have like a sneaky 11 stash in his jacket? And Jesus says, no, 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 I'm sustained by doing the will of my Father in heaven. It's incredible. He says, literally, he's sustained by doing the will of his Father in heaven. It's incredible. Are we sustained by doing the will of God? Is that the thing that satiates us? There's our word again, Nick. We, there's a thing that satiates us, the, doing the will of God. We can rise above everything and the difficulties in our life, the things and the problems we face, when we are content and filled with the bread of life from God. We are able to face the problems and the things that we come across our life when we are filled with the bread of life, when we are content on what God gives us, on doing His will. When it's enough to do God's will, you've got enough money, you've got enough, you've got enough, you've got enough. You can put anything after that you want. When you're doing the will of God, you have enough of everything that you need. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But I love what happens later on in that teaching, in the, in the response of the, the people when they leave. So what happens is the people say, uh, verse 60, we read it, on hearing it, many of the disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And then later down in 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And again, a beautiful contrast between the crowd and the disciples. Those who are seeing the miracles and are on the outside and see about and know about Jesus, but they're not intimate with him. And the disciples who are close and intimate with him. The, the crowd who's loving the, yes, they bring people for healing and it's amazing and like 5,000 of us got fed. Their response is to focus on the teaching. Their response is to focus on the practical. This is a hard teaching. And what they're actually saying is that I've got this framework where I'm going to decide what's right and wrong and what you're saying doesn't fit within that framework. So I'm going to reject it. Man, do we do that with Jesus? Do we read some stuff and be like, hmm, that sounded a bit hectic. I'm not going to do that part. We'll We'll push that one to the side and we'll look at that later in life, Jesus. You need to live a generous life. Yeah, yeah, but Lord, like times are tough. Eh? Petrol prices, like it's going up a lot. So maybe later on we'll live a generous life. But for now, let's just focus on praying, Jesus. We're just going to pray. That one fits nicely in my paradigm. Doesn't really cost me too much. <laughs> but we're honest. I mean, we're like that, aren't we? we, we and, and that's what they have. The crowd said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Their focus is on how the teaching makes them feel. Their focus, they, they, they filter what Jesus is telling them through kind of their own sensibilities. 
And it's not wrong to use our brains and it's not wrong to, to have ways of thinking. And we do need to do that so that we don't get caught out and we, we're not you know, led down the garden path by wrong teaching. But essentially, these people are their own gods. They are the ones sitting in charge of their life and saying, I will decide what is right and wrong. I will filter your teaching through what I want to be and what I think. And it's I, I, I. I cannot accept it. It's too hard for me. And it's the wrong way around. And they leave and they miss it. And they miss out on life with Jesus. They miss out on the Son of God in His physical presence. We all think, man, if I was there, I would never have left. I would have followed. It would be amazing to be around Jesus. I'm not so sure it would be as amazing as we think it is. Because He's harsh in some moments. And we see it here. And He's 5,000 people and we're like, yeah, see the kingdom of God's expanding. We need a building. We need a tent. We need a generator. This is going to be amazing. We're going to have 20,000 by the end of next week because you're going to feed. And, it's, and Jesus says, I'm going. And you're like, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. There's a lot of people here who need you, Jesus. And he says, I'm going. And he gives them a teaching and you're like, oh, maybe not on the first day, bro. Like you've just fed them. Don't come with that one on the first day. Like let's, let's get them hooked in a little bit before you give the harsh teaching, Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, no, you're missing out. This is the thing. It's, it's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you going beyond what you understand and what you like and don't like. But Peter's response shows how the disciples should respond, shows how we should respond. Peter doesn't necessarily understand what's going on. And I love Peter. Peter's so blunt. He is a blunt instrument because what's in his heart comes out. And like Jesus asked the disciples, and Peter speaks up. Oaks come to attack Jesus and he's out with the sword and off with the oak's ear. He's just, I dig him, he's just raw and real and he makes this, he's got proper foot and mouth disease and he like says things wrong and but he's a beautiful human being. And Jesus has got so much grace and patience and time with him. And Peter here again, he blurts out this thing where he says, he, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter's like, he's like, I don't understand this. I've got nowhere else to go. Like, we've given up everything else for you. I don't necessarily understand what you're saying, but I, those are words of eternal life. I'm going to choose to believe that what you're saying is that. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. See, his focus is not on the teaching. His focus is on Jesus. He's going, I know who you are, so I'm going to, even though I don't accept it, I'm going to choose to believe that those are the words of eternal life. And that's the difference between the crowd and a disciple. One is focused on the teaching and the physical and what can I get out of it? And the other is focused on the person and Jesus and how do I be with you? His focus, he calls Jesus the Holy One of God. His focus is on him. Are we filtering everything we read and hear and what God speaks to us through our own sensibilities? Are we filtering it through what we consider right and wrong? Do we say we can love, but we're going to love in our way? You see, and I love what the Bible does. <laughs> Use the word love very flippantly there, sorry. But the Bible says God is love. And that means that God gets to define love. Love is not God. We'll do a sermon on that one day. But God gets to define what love looks like. And this is the most loving thing Jesus could do for them because he could see very quickly that they were getting caught up in seeing and being part of the miracles. They wanted the nice and fluffy. And, and Jesus says, no, no. He realized that the miracles were starting to become a stumbling block for those people to believe and to follow in him. So he cuts through and he penetrates with a difficult word and says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. <coughs> so are we filtering the teachings of Jesus and what he says to us through our own sensibilities? When, when Jesus says that we must give, do we, do we budget it out very carefully? Do we go, hmm... I, uh, I, got, I got 12 Rand 74 you can have this month, Lord, if you get in early. Um, you know, it's kind of like your kids. When you, you buy your kids an ice cream, you know, can I have a bite? And they, or like a chocolate. Chocolate. They don't fold the wrapper back very far. <laughs> or they keep their fingers there, so you can't, <laughs> you can't bite very much. My kids know me well. But, and you're like, I just paid for that. That whole chocolate is mine, actually. <laughs> like, I, I own that chocolate. Like, the other that you're eating is... And we're like that. We, God says give, and we're like, okay, Lord, you can have like a little piece. Just fold the thing. Or they break it off and you give it to them. Or do we give in obedience? When he sends us, when, when God says go, and he says go next door, go across the room, go and speak to that person, go across the border, do we go, okay, well, let me just see what my calendar's doing next, um, next year. This year's a bit full, but um, I'll, 
we, we try and fit the obedience to God neatly into our lives. Yeah. And we try and, and, and unfortunately, Jesus says, I, I'm not an add-on on your life. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a thing that you can just, everything else in our lives must be subordinated to God, must be subordinated to Jesus. How we speak to one another, how we treat our spouses and our kids, how we treat people around us, must be subordinated to Jesus. Friends, Jesus begs us this morning, come and die at the foot of the cross. Come and lay down our lives because it's good for us. So that he can raise us up in newness of life. And I promise you, there will be moments when it'll be the most difficult thing you've ever done. But on the whole, it'll bring you more joy than you could ever have by doing it your own way. We're going to take communion now. And I want us to just, hey man, just take a few moments. So, so won't you go up and grab the bread and the, and the wine and uh, juice. Um, just grab a little cup and, and you can stand around, stand together and just take, we're, gonna, we're just going to have a moment, a few moments of, of silence. Nick, won't you play, buddy? I'm just, just strumming. You don't have to play any, sing anything, but just play some music. Um, and we're just going to take a minute or two to come before God in this moment. And ask Jesus, how should my life be different now living in union with you? Dean and Nicole are going to get married hopefully soon. But they haven't set a date yet. It's only been like four days. So, but they're going to. And, they're going to and, and their lives will be irrevocably changed from that moment on. It will never be the same. Never. Well, those of you who married, you know. Life is different when you're married. Somebody else keeps squeezing the freaking toothpaste from the middle. And you don't know who it is. But it's not me. I'm kidding. It's not a real problem. But we have these things where we live different when we're in union with another person. Life has changed. And it's the same with us. When we take communion, we're in union with Jesus. That's why it's called communion. Come union. It's not really, but anyway, I just made that up. But it's communion. We get into union with Jesus. We take, his bread, we take his body and his blood in. And again, we're, we do not believe that in the moment that this becomes the actual body and it's a symbol. And we remember what he's done on the cross. So, once you, where you're at, just uh, jump up and grab a, um, a cup or a, a little glass and some, some bread.